I'm going to invite Lorraine Busby to bring Will forward and introduce him to us. The Social Action and Outreach Committee is pleased to introduce Will Robertson, our speaker for today's Minute for Mission, and our Lunch and Learn speaker after the service. Will will tell you that there are only two things that you really need to know about him. First, he is from New Brunswick and remains a very proud New Brunswicker. Second, he is passionate about basic income. I think he must eat, sleep, speak, live, and function in all things basic income. At the national level, Will is a steering committee member of Coalition Canada Basic Income, and he has ties to the Universal Basic Income, UBI Works, and the Basic Income Canada Youth Network. On the provincial level, he is on the executive of Ontario Basic Income Network and maintains ties with other provincial groups, particularly those in New Brunswick. On the municipal level, he co-chairs Basic Income Ottawa, where he is leading efforts to get a municipal motion passed at City Council, uh, and it's a motion that supports a federally funded basic income. Earlier, he successfully championed similar motions in Fredericton and St. John, New Brunswick, uh, along with other places. And he's also was supporting similar successful motions in several Nova Scotia communities, as well as St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador. In less than two weeks, he will be returning to New Brunswick to be an invited panel participant in a United Church-sponsored event, Reimagining Communities. But that is the future, and this is now. Thank you, Will, for coming, and welcome to Rideau Park. Thank you to everybody for welcoming, welcoming us here today. It's wonderful to be with all of you. As, uh, as Lorraine said, my name is Will Robertson, and I'm the co chair of Basic Income Ottawa. And thank you for inviting me to speak in the place of worship today. It is a privilege which humbles me greatly. When considering what to say here today, it affirms my personal stance that politics in the pulpit may not be. And therefore, in this time, I will speak to the need for basic income from a human lens and not a policy lens. Indeed, the latter will be the focus of our lunch and learn today. I come before you today to speak of the poverty of community, the poverty of the soul of which reflects a fifth our society today, and of which you are all chiefly poised to help address through faith and empathy. By poverty of community, I mean that one cannot adhere to the commandment to love thy neighbor if one does not deign to even know or recognize their neighbor, let alone care for them. In 1987, American poet and civil rights activist James Baldwin spoke to this breakdown of human community which faces us today. There has been a breakdown, a betrayal of the social contract in Western life. People are grabbing for things and holding on to what they think they can get and stepping all over their neighbors because they are panic-stricken. Something is beginning to crack. They hold all of this because they don't have anything else. But they don't really believe in it. And they'll kill to get it. But that proves the moral bankruptcy, which translates to the actual bankruptcy of the world in which we live. We have yet to understand that if I am starving, you are in danger. In our world today, where lines of food banks are growing exponentially, food insecurity is rising, communities struggle to address crises of addictions, mental health, and homelessness, it is indeed clear that there has been a breakdown of the social contract. While accepting the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated that our problem today is that we have allowed the internal to become lost and the external, we have allowed the means by which we live to outdistance the ends for which we live. 
In essence, humanity has become bonded to material necessity. Pursuing economic growth and prosperity instead of healthy and equitable communities where life is good for all, and not merely for those who have supposedly earned it. More and more people live today in desperation for material things, as Baldwin described, and the seeming mass amnesia of the story of Genesis. Have we collectively forgotten the consequences of greed and yielding to temptation? In a world where young people seek attention and not joy, where professionals pursue career advancement and not happiness, where leaders yearn for a platform and profile and not service to their community, one must wonder if we have forgotten the basic tenets of loving one another and living in community. There seems to be a distinct lack of empathy and understanding. In our world, fed by social media and polarization, we cannot begin to address the terrible social crises we face collectively if we cannot even recall that we are our brother's keeper. The problem of our time is that man has been alienated from the modern world in the sense that the world is no longer a representation for him in the touchstone of reality. Human beings have become detached from artificial inheritance, sorry, whose experiences have been reduced to subjective, private ones. The world is no longer our common heritage, but a whole being in permanent transformation. The world does not offer man a stable dwelling place, but the result that he experiences himself as worldly. In this way, his security has been undermined and his life deprived of meaning. In a world where social media takes up so much of our lives, and people spend less time interacting with family, friends, and their community, more and more individuals feel lonely and worldly. In this deprivation of meaning and disconnect from reality, it is increasingly difficult for us to care about the world and just people physically around us. If you go to bed scrolling on your phone in an apartment, do you even know the first name of the person setting their head down on the pillow next door? When you walk into work every morning, do you know the name of the security guard or of the young lady working at the coffee shop you pass by on a daily basis? Have you asked your nurse how she was doing? Really? If you walk by somebody panhandling or sleeping on the sidewalk, do you recoil or look at them with apprehension in your heart? When you drive by the shelter or mission and see people struggling with addiction, do you see them with any scorn? If someone cannot afford to pay for their drink or is late on their rent, do you see them any less? When having a discussion with someone or reading an article that espouses views you disagree with, do you turn to anger and disgust? Or do you look to understand and respect the difference of views? These are the intrinsic questions we must ask ourselves when wondering if we truly love our neighbor and if we are indeed connected to the world around us. We must ask ourselves if the person we want to be is the one who looks away from those experiencing hardship or if we are to be the person who reaches out our hands and reminds them that they are not alone. The problem in our world today is that far too many of us look away when an outstretched hand may be the very thing someone needs to alleviate their suffering. This is the poverty of the soul and poverty of community I speak of. In putting forward this colossal challenge we face together, I can understand those who may turn to a sense of dismay or pessimism. Yet in this room, speaking to a group with deep sense of faith, hear me clearly when I say that you have a part to play in addressing this challenge and in making our world a better place. We may not solve poverty, homelessness, or addiction crises in our time today, but we can commit to sharing more love, empathy, and remain dutiful in building community, in reaching out a hand, as it were, to break the sense of loneliness and hopelessness that so many feel by showing them faith, love, and reminding them in your own way that they too can find grace. In the 17th century peace paradise lost, John Milton tells the story of Genesis and what is one of the most important pieces of English literature ever written. 
In it, Milton writes a couple of seminal passages that I'd like to share here with you today. In chapter 3, Milton's God speaks of humanity in stating that man had of me all he could have. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, so free to fall. Later in the poem, the archangel Raphael says to Adam, Freely we serve, because freely we love, as in our will, to love or not, in this we stand or fall. Let me repeat that. Freely we serve, because freely we love, as in our will, to love or not, in this we stand or fall. The prophet Muhammad tells us in the Ahadith that he who sleeps on a full stomach whilst his neighbor goes hungry is not one of us. Those of you gathered here today are those who choose to love and not to rest on a full stomach while your neighbor goes hungry. You understand that our most basic human connection is our shared suffering and love, which binds us and leads us to grace. You are all willing to reach out a hand to those struggling or to those who trespass against you. In other words, you are all key in building and preserving community and an empathetic understanding of the world and people around us. The world needs more empathy, more love, and more people willing to reach out a hand to those around them. In that same vein, for that same reason, those struggling and suffering and abject poverty deserve a hand up to a life of dignity and equity to provide them the opportunity to release themselves from the shackles of their own misfortunes. They need an outstretched hand to remind them that they are not alone and that there is a life of love and joy for them to be lived and grace for them to attain despite their pain or past. In the end, that is simpler. Everyone deserves an opportunity to bring their lost ship of life back on course, just as no one is unworthy of returning to God's grace. And so, I say to you, considering the challenge before us, to love or not, in this we stand or fall.